What's up party people, it's your boy Optimus Code. Welcome to the channel. So today we're gonna kick it up a notch. We're not gonna go super high advanced yet because we're still uh, working out the preliminaries, getting everybody up to speed on the basics first so we can get to this higher level stuff. But today though, we're gonna kick it up a notch and we're gonna discuss compilers, opcodes, machine language, assembly programmers, all the good stuff that's leading up to computer optimizations. If you stick around to the end of the video, you'll be in a much better position to understand all that goes into optimizing graphics for a computer game. Let's get it. Okay, so we're not gonna waste any time. We're gonna get right to it. But if you missed the last video in this series, you really need to check that out because it is the foundation from which this video builds on. So I will leave a link to it in the description. We left off talking about compilers and machine language. So let's get back into that. Okay, so when we left off the last time, we had discussed how most programming languages are high level languages. And even though these are computer programs and these are written in a computer programming language, it's still not enough for a computer to then be able to read this program because a computer only understands binary zeros and ones. And so what we have to do is we have to take this program and run it through a compiler and the compiler will then take the high level program code, convert it into low level machine code, which you see here. And then this stuff can be read by a computer. So one thing we need to point out here is that this is what's called machine code. So each computer chip has a set of instructions that it can perform and programmers use these instructions like we said in the earlier video, programmers use these instructions to send commands to the computer for the computer to perform some custom behavior. Now, some people think that every computer chip has the same instructions, especially if they're from the same architecture. This is not true. Not every chip has the same instruction set and not every computer chip uses the same opcodes for each instruction set. An opcode is basically the name of an instruction, but in computer language terms or in binary code. So where we may call an instruction push, the opcode for it may be like 00110. The point being that the opcode for a human will be similar to the name. And in the computer parlance, the opcode is the name of the instruction, but it's not written in English-like statements. It's all in binary. So every computer chip does not have the same instruction set, even if they're from the same architecture and every computer chip does not have the same opcodes for the same instructions, even if they are in the same architecture. Okay, so in order to get anything done, a programmer must use the instruction sets that come with the chip that they're writing the program for, which brings up the notion again of the compiler. When we need to get something done, programmers program at this high level. The compiler compiles to machine code, which is low level. This is the resulting binary machine code. However, since not every processor has the same machine code, the same instructions, the same opcodes, if you want to run this program on a different computer, say this one, you have to get a new compiler that knows how to compile for the processor that's in this computer. It will then compile down to machine code and then the binary code here will have the correct opcodes and instructions and all that good stuff to run on the processor that's in this computer. If you wanna run on this computer, then you have to compile it for this machine. Same here. You have to compile it for this machine. Just because you have a compiler doesn't mean that you can compile the code to run on any machine. That's why we have multiple compilers to generate machine code for multiple processes. And that's very important, y'all. The reason why this is important is because it is unlikely that a human being will know the machine code for this processor and then know the machine code for this processor. Now notice I didn't say it's impossible, I said it's unlikely. Um, we'll get to that here in a minute. I'm not sure we'll get to it in this video. We will certainly get to assembly programmers soon 
because they are the key to optimization. But let me explain why first. So let's just say you wanna buy a computer. So say here you're looking to buy a new MacBook Pro and you go through all of this stuff and you get down to the processor. And here's where we need to focus. So one of your choices is a processor, a six core processor that runs at 2.6 gigahertz. Here's another one that has eight cores, but they run at 2.3 gigahertz. And you see they can boost up to four and a half gigahertz and 4.8 gigahertz. Well, what does this mean exactly? Well, the way you measure the ability of a processor is you count. So when you say that this processor can handle 2.6 gigahertz per second, so what that means is this processor can do 2.6 billion clock cycles per second. Again, just to recap, this processor can do 2.6 billion clock cycles per second. So every second, this thing can perform 2.6 billion clock cycles. All right, why is that relevant? glad you asked. So let's go here. Once a program has been compiled and it's an executable and it's sitting on a hard drive, when you want to run that program, the very first thing that happens is this program is loaded into RAM here. And then that RAM consists of these instructions so that this computer can process them. And so part of it will be the opcode, and then the operand. And the opcode, like I said earlier, was just the name of the command. So for example, we want you to move this from here to here, whatever the case may be. We're not gonna get in the um, specifics there because it's not necessary for you guys to understand the gist of this. The point is, is that this code, the compiler has generated an executable, which is a collection of these opcodes and these operands, these instructions. And this opcode is going to tell this processor to perform this instruction on this memory address. Let's just assume that this instruction takes 100 clock cycles. And then this instruction takes another 100 clock cycles so that this entire program takes 600 clock cycles to complete. That means then that this program could run on this processor, assuming this processor can handle 2.6 billion cycles per second. This program, which takes a total of 600 clock cycles, can run on this processor, assuming it's doing nothing else, assuming this processor gets to use all of its clock cycles on this program, then this program can be run over 4 million times per second. The way you measure the performance of a program, of an executable, the less cycles that it uses, the better it is. For a processor, the more cycles that it has, the better it is. The whole point of optimizing video games is to reduce the number of cycles that it takes because then you can do more of them in any given second. So if we go back to the compilers for a minute, one thing you'll notice is that the compiler here generates this code for this processor in the same way that this compiler generates this code for this processor. What that means is the compiler will determine how many clock cycles it takes to run your program. This compiler is determining the opcodes and the instructions that need to be invoked to make this program run on a machine code level. An assembly programmer is someone who skips the compiler and writes this machine level code by themselves. And the way that they do that in a general sense is they look at each operation and they'll say this operation is taking 340,000 cycles. I can probably get that down to 100,000 cycles by manually manipulating these bits so that an operation that took 340,000 cycles now only takes 100,000 cycles. And they'll do that often in different areas of the rendering pipeline. An assembly programmer will bypass the high level language, bypass the compiler. They will go straight to the machine code and they will start manipulating these bits directly. And this is what we call coding to the metal or programming to the metal because you bypass all the high level stuff and all the compilers and you go right to here. There's an assembler involved, but that's not really necessary for this conversation. The programmer at this level focuses on optimizing this bit pattern so that it takes the least amount of cycles 
to run this program. And the less cycles it takes, the more times it can run in a given second. And for us as games, that translates to more frames per second. But at the end of the day, having more performance, what it really means is either this thing takes less clock cycles to run or you have more clock cycles to run your programs. Changing and upgrading your components will give you more cycles. An assembly programmer will make this same program take less cycles. And both of those will accomplish the same thing. If you put them together, if you have an assembly programmer optimize these operations so that they take the fewest amount of cycles possible to run, then the same program running on a beefier box will get even faster because now you have more cycles in which to run it and it takes less cycles to run. And so the performance goes to the roof. So you can add in a bunch of other effects and all types of stuff. You won't notice any hit to your frame rate or any of that good stuff because you have so many cycles that you can use and the code doesn't require that many cycles in the first place. Okay, y'all, so the best way to think about this is to think about it as if it's money or currency. Let's just say the clock cycles represent how much money you have. We'll use US dollars for this example. So let's say you have $2.6 billion and you have to spend that every second. So every second you're gonna get a new $2.6 billion but it doesn't carry over to the next second, right? So like, if you don't spend it all, it's just gone. And let's just say that you're running a game and that game costs $1 million to run. Every second you can run that game 2,600 times. So for our purposes, that would mean you have a frame rate of 2,600 frames per second. It costs you a million dollars to run that game but you have $2.6 billion to spend. So you can, and you're only spending your money on this game. So every second then you can run this game 2,600 times. If we have an assembly programmer come in and optimize this game so that now it only costs $100,000 to run the game, you still have to spend that $2.6 billion every second, but now, because it costs less to run that same game, now you can run that game 26,000 times in the same one second. Why? Because the cost to run the game got cheaper. How did it get cheaper? Because it costs less. And in our computer example, this is the exact same thing. You have 2.6 billion clock cycles. Each game is gonna require a certain amount of cost cycles to run. Per second, the fewer cycles that game consumes, the more times it can run in any given second. This is the very basics of computer optimization. Assembly programmers are vital to this process. But remember what we said, this computer will require a different set of machine code because it has different opcodes and it also has different instruction set. Just like on this one, the assembly programmer had to custom craft this code to run in fewer cycles on this machine. They would have to do that same thing for this machine. So the optimizations that they did here will not automatically work here. So they will have to redo that process again for this processor and they would have to do it for each one. So now we're just scratching the surface here. Like I said at the beginning, we're gonna go just a little bit higher than we've been going before, not much. And just to reiterate, this stuff here is a precursor for the real optimization stuff that we're gonna to get to soon. So remember these basics, and when we discuss optimizations, we are talking about clock cycles. The whole key to it all is clock cycles. We need our instructions to run in fewer clock cycles. All right, now, let's take the quiz.
Okay, that's it. Time's up. Quiz over. Pencils down. How did y'all do? Hopefully this one was easy for y'all to follow and you were able to do well on the quiz. If not, watch it again. Whatever ones you got wrong, make sure you pay attention to those areas in the video. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like. Let me know that you're enjoying the content. If you want more of this and you enjoy where the channel is going, then go ahead and subscribe so that you can be notified when we drop new videos. And we appreciate the support that you've shown thus far. And hopefully these videos are helping level up and educate everyone. And hopefully you're gaining confidence the more you engage with the channel. All right, we'll see y'all next time. Peace.